angels ascend and descend in this place. May the angels of the Lord that are assigned to the word today ascend and descend in power in the name of Jesus. We thank you now that this is a place of supernatural activity. We don't approach you in the flesh right now. We renounce carnality. We renounce uh, timidity. We renounce the flesh right now. And we ask, Lord, that our spirit will bear witness with your spirit. Hallelujah. That the Son of God will be revealed in a greater way today, Lord. May the scales that are on our eyes fall and melt in this city to be praised. And so we thank you now, Father, for fresh vision. Oh, God, you now, Father, for fresh vision. Oh, God, for fresh sight. Oh, God, for fresh truth in the name of Jesus. Oh, yes. I feel that. May we see truth today and may we respond with humility. May we see truth today and we bow at a greater level. Oh, yes. May the spirit of humility rest in this house. Oh, yes. For you said that you give grace to the humble and you resist the proud. And so, Father, I ask now for a grace to hit this house. Oh, yes. Your grace. Your grace. Your grace. A grace that makes preaching easy for the apostle. A grace that makes worship easy for us, God. Your grace as we humble ourselves. Oh, yes. As we humble ourselves, we ask for a grace. Oh, yes. A grace that distinguishes us. Hallelujah. For you called us to be a peculiar people, a people chosen, set apart for your works. And so, Father, I ask now that your works would be made manifest in us today in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And may you, oh, yeah, may the fire of the Lord fill this house even now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We release your fire in this place, your fire that comes to purify, your fire that comes to judge, your fire that comes to set apart. Oh, yes. We say yes to the fire. We say yes to the fire that comes to set us apart. Yes. Oh, yes. The fire that comes to consecrate. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The fire that comes to consecrate is in the house. Hallelujah. We thank you for the fire that comes to set us apart. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. We thank you now that we will embrace you, that we will embrace the Son of the living God, that we will embrace the truth, that we will embrace the Father. Thank you, Jesus, for the embrace in this house. Come on, just embrace your Father. Just embrace your King. And as you embrace Him, there's a fire of consecration coming. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, we thank you that our sound will be pure before you today. Woo! Yes, that our sound, that our sound will be pure. That the fragrance of our worship would please you. Yes, that it would please you. Oh, anybody want to be pleasing to the Father? Lord, that our posture may be pleasing unto you. Yes, we humble ourselves so that we can please you. Not to satisfy our agenda, but Lord, may your kingdom agenda be exalted in the earth. May this be a place where it's a womb for your kingdom agenda to be extended forth in the earth in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you now. And so even now, God, we get a yes on our hearts. We get a yes on our lips. We get a yes in our spirit. Come on, tell the Lord yes. That's the key. Tell the Lord yes. We say yes, you can move. We say yes, you can have your way. We, yes, you can shift things. Yes, you can deliver. Yes, you can heal. Yes, you can set free. Oh, yeah, 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 yes, 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 you can have your way. Yes, you can have your way. Yes, Lord, we want you to be welcome with the yes. We want you to be welcome with the yes. And we offer no resistance to your will. We offer no resistance to your will. Oh, we say our hearts are open. The doors are open. The doors of the church are open. We declare an opening in this place. An opening for you to land. 
Elise, we thank you for being here in the house. We are Pastors Torian and Randy Butler. We are your hosts for today. Wow, the power that's already going forth. On behalf of our Apostle Smith, Hugh Smith and Pastor Letha, we want to welcome you to Embassy. Those of you who are viewing via live stream, whether you're live or you're watching it on repeat, please like, share, subscribe. This good news coming from this church under the kingdom of God. Oh, and those of you who are in service, if throughout service you need any help, please don't hesitate to get the attention of one of our guest services folks or our security protocol, anyone. Amen? We had such a rich time at our 8 o'clock service this morning. And if you missed it, you want to attend. Now, it's not televised, so you come on in where we're studying the word with the word. Amen? I, 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 I talked a little bit in the 8 o'clock service. There's so many ways that to die. One of the things we used to watch on uh, cable was a thousand ways to die. And when we turn on our TV, when we look at the, the news, all of this death, all of these different things, all these different things to scare the believer, COVID-19, cancer, diabetes, you name it. But there's only one way to die, and that's to die daily. That's the only way to live, and that's the only way to die, is to die daily so that you can continue to testify about the goodness of God. You can continue to live out his promises, the things that we find in the Bible, in the preached word. Amen. We're going to go before the Lord in prayer. Amen. I am crucified with Christ. Yes. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but it's Christ who lives within me. So, Father, we thank you this morning, God. We're grateful for another opportunity to gather in your name, Jesus. We're grateful, oh God, to be called by your name. We're grateful, oh God, to be counted among the saints in the name of Jesus. We're grateful, oh God, to carry the very nature and the DNA of Christ, oh God. We are grateful, oh God, to be in the service of the King one more time, oh God. We thank you, oh God. We can't praise you enough for the things that you have done. We give you glory, oh God. I pray that our worship ascends to you, Father, today. I pray that it comes before you as incense, God, and that it is pleasing unto your nostrils, oh God. I pray you would stir up every gift in this house, mobilize every gift in this house to your glory, oh God. I pray, oh God, that we would walk worthy of the vocation of those callings, oh God, for bearing one another in love, endeavoring in the spirit of unity, oh God. Bless us today, oh God. Keep us. We dedicate this service to you. Get the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. I just feel the joy of the Lord in this place. I just feel the joy of the Lord in this place. Your weeping may have endured for a night, but joy comes in the morning. All you gotta do is say, good morning. Can I just hear you say, good morning? Welcome to the joy of the Lord. We're walking in the joy
Let's everybody clap. Your light can drown our darkness and bring our joy to light. We won't submit to sorrow. Our joy is coming in the morning. Yeah. In the morning. Yeah.
stress, only stress, yes, yes. Only one night though. Only one night though. Only one night though. Ain't no need to worry, but the night is gonna break. Cause it'll be all over in the morning. What the night is gonna bring. Come on, one time, can we all say? It'll be, it'll be all over in the morning. Hallelujah. It's morning time, y'all. Can you say good morning? God, we thank you for your presence that's here with us. We thank you for your joy, your peace, your healing, your deliverance. We thank you for sanctifying us, God. And we just want to say we love you, God. We love you, God. We love you, God. We love you, God. Come like a rushing wind. Come like a rushing wind. Come like never before.
is your name You're the only one that can save We praise your name You're the only one that can save us Oh, let your glory fill this temple, oh God Let your glory cover the earth, oh God. Let your glory cover the earth. We honor your precious holy name, oh God. We thank you for your sweet holy presence. Come on, keep those hands lifted all over the room. I will bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, I will bless his holy name. I, I will bless your holy name. We bless your name. We bless your name. spoke those words let there be light and there was and in that same breath the stars all align with one voice creation cries you do all things well yes you do all things well so be
for your name is great. dry bones that he, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Ezekiel and set him in a valley filled with dry bones. The dry bones in the text represented the nation of Israel that was shattered and torn. But I hear the Holy Ghost saying there's some dry bones somewhere in our life right now. There's a situation, there's a situation that, that is dry, there's a situation that is dry that God wants you to speak to right now. There's an anointing on your life to speak to a dry situation and God says he's going to cause life to enter into it in this very moment. Lord, I want to thank you for the prophetic grace that's hitting the house right now to speak to a situation in the name of Jesus. I don't know where the dry bone is, but I want you to think about something in your life for about 15 seconds. And if it's dry, God said, there's a window that just hit the room. There's a prophetic grace. Somebody said, I'm not a prophet, but, but there's, there's a time when the spirit of the prophetic can come upon a whole house. And I declare the release of the prophetic on this whole house just for this moment. Saul was one time among the prophets and he was able to prophesy because he was in the midst of a prophetic company. I declare the, re the release of the prophetic energy in the room now in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, I'm asking you to give us boldness now to remember something that's dead and dry. The first thing he told us to do was prophesy to the wind. That means you got to speak out to the atmosphere that you're a part of. It could be your home. It could be your situation. But I need you to prophesy to that thing and declare the word of the Lord to it. 
I don't know what the word of the Lord is, but I'm sure it's not die. It's got to be live. You got to declare something to live in your life now. Now, if an ordinary person said it, nothing will happen. But if the prophecy, if the spirit of the prophet is on you, prophecy activates life. Prophecy activates what's going on in the heavens. And I'm declaring there's an anointing in the room right now to activate God himself in the midst of your situation. You're getting ready to activate God in the midst of a dark place. Glory to God. I prophesy to this place in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I prophesy to a dry financial situation in Jesus' name. I prophesy to dead financial conditions in Jesus' name. I prophesy to a bankrupt situation in the name of the Lord. And I command an economy to come alive in that situation. I command sharing and caring to take place in that situation. I command gifts to come into your life people to give freely unto you because the Lord has prospered them. I, 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 I believe that God is going to put it on somebody's heart to come and drop a gift off in your life because God's building economy in a dead situation. Somebody's going to be burdened tonight and they're going to have to call you before the day is over to drop something in your life because I prophesy to a dead economic situation. I command economy, activity. I command stimulation of your situation in the name of the Lord. I wonder if there's anybody that will come into an agreement with that. I need you to prophesy now. Then you got to speak to the bones. Speak to the dry situation and say, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Can these bones live? You got to tell that house to live. You got to tell that family to live. You got to tell that marriage to live. You got to tell that business to live. God said, if you speak to it under this anointing, there's a power that's going to command it to live. I release the prophetic in this house now. Speak. Yes. Tell those young people to live. Tell your neighbor's house to live. You got about 60 more seconds to prophesy to your situation under this anointing. Glory to God. Then Ezekiel said he heard a rumbling in the valley. He said he heard a rumbling down in the situation. There's going to be some activity that takes place in your life. There's some movement that's about to happen in that situation. It's been stuck for a long time, but God is going to unstick that thing right now. The people that wouldn't move are going to move. Things that wouldn't happen are going to happen. The devil had it bound. your 
spirit man are you believing your God without faith it is impossible to please God but he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him You've been praying for God to take you out the valley, but God says he's going to transform your valley, and that's what he's doing in this moment. He's transforming the valley. Ooh. Come on, lift those hands and let's worship him now. He. Glory to God. I need you. Hallelujah. 
He's moving in my life. He's on the move. There was a young lady here the night we were doing the miracle and healing service, Mother Linda. And she reached out to us and told us that when we called out individuals having uh, lumps on their breasts and God was healing them, she said she claimed it for herself. And she said in that moment they dissolved. This is what she said. But wait a minute, she just what she said they This is Mother Linda. She's gonna come and tell her own story. She's watching by live stream now, but she said they dissolved on the spot, but then she went to the doctor to get stuff checked out to make sure there was no cancer or no nothing. And she texted us this week and said, the doctor said there's nothing there. It's all gone by the power of the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. Somebody shout, he says, he's still healing bodies. Oh! She's going to tell the story, but I couldn't wait until she got up here. I wanted you to know that our God is a healing Jesus. Is that right? And what he's done for one, he'll do for two. And if you're sick in your body right now, you might as well let that testimony inspire you to declare no sick zone right around your life right now. I dare you to say a no sick zone. Nobody in this conference, circumference can be sick because the power of God is on my life. You gotta know how to declare your healing. You gotta say it's my right. I am, it's, it's my covenant right.
Nobody like our God. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches over me. Thank you, Jesus. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. God, I thank you for the healing power that has healed Mother Linda's body like only you can. And I pray if there's someone else in this room right now that they would just have the faith to believe God. Maybe you're watching by live stream, but you would just have the faith to believe God to touch you right where you are and heal you of any sickness and any disease. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. While you're standing, I'm going to ask everybody to turn in your Bibles to the gospel according to St. John. And those of you watching by live stream, thank you for allowing us to come into your homes today. you share with those you know and let them know that we're live at this point. And we're going to begin reading at verse number one. That again, that is St. John chapter 17. And we're going to begin reading at verse number one. The scripture says, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou have given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Verse 4, everybody. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gave me to do. Read, and now, O oh Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And I want you to skip down to verse 13. And there it says, and now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest Keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. 
Thy word is truth. And thou hast sent me into the world, even so I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. And today we're going to continue sharing with you on the subject of the testimony of Jesus. And specifically today we're going to talk about the teacher's testimony. Everybody say the teacher's testimony. Father, thank you for grace. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Amen. The teacher's testimony. We're going to formally greet our guests at the balance of the service. While praying on last week, the Lord reminded me of a specific decree that guarantees the preservation of life, fruitfulness, and legacy for all believers who practice sanctification. Again, the Lord reminded me of one of his decrees that guarantee three things, preservation of life, fruitfulness, and legacy for all believers who practice sanctification. This holds significant relevance at this moment in time because we're currently witnessing a pervasive trend where memories are being erased, fruit is withering, and legacies are being destroyed. If we weren't living in such a horrific time, then the decree may not be relevant. But as I said before, we're in the day where memories are being erased, fruit is withering on the vine, and legacies are being destroyed. The scripture talks about this in many passages. One is Proverbs 10 and 7. And I want you to put it on the screen so you can see it for yourself. What does it say? Read with me. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. There are individuals who do things, may have success in one generation, but because of wickedness, their name is erased. Their memory is forgotten. Legacy can be destroyed. Look at Job 18 and 16 and 17. And let's further layer the thought there. What does it say? Read. This is referring to the wicked. This is referring to the wicked. What does it say? His roots shall be dried up beneath and above shall his branch be cut off read the remember his remembrance shall perish from the earth and he shall have no name in the streets do not ever believe that the wicked will continue forever there are many people who have gotten gained the wrong way and have moved up the ladder, but the Bible says the memory of the wicked shall be cut off and vanished away. As a matter of fact, it shall rot, meaning it shall so slowly dissipate with a stench until it's no more remembered. You might remember the Gucci uh, company um, that was started by the father. Um, he successfully raised his company to prominence and he passed it on in 1953 to his son Aldo. And he took that company and gave it international prominence to the point where John F. Kennedy actually recognized it. But shortly after he gained prominence, his son, which would be the third generation, 
wanted to start his own clothing line within the company and he was forbidden by his father and uncle. But he went ahead and did it anyway without their permission. They fired him and in an effort to get vengeance on his own father, he exposed his father's tax misgivings and sent his father to prison. He and his cousin took over the company and literally ruined the Gucci name under their reign. By the time that they were done, the company was $17.3 million into debt and they sold it to Investment Corps who resurrected the company and it is what we know it is today. The point being is the name is no longer associated with the true Gucci's. There are other people running the company making money because the memory of the wicked shall be cut off. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't pay to be wicked. If the only way I can get up the ladder is by hook and crook, then I'm going to stay right where I am because hooking and crooking will ultimately come back on you. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. But we don't have to worry about that because that's not our portion. Somebody say, that is not our portion. Amen. As a matter of fact, on the flip side of it, the scripture says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor set us in the seat of the scornful. Uh, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. What is that? Sanctification. And in that law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Watch this. And that bringeth forth his fruit in his season and his leaf will not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I just come to announce today that that, that, that perishing of your fruit and the, the destruction of your legacy and the withering of what you produce is not your portion. Your portion, if you are sanctified, is preservation, number one, and sustained fruit and a legacy. So I want to declare that over your life right now. A grace, number one, to be sanctified. And secondly, a grace to experience sustained fruit and a legacy in the midst of a decaying society. While the rest of society is decaying, I'm declaring that you shall bring forth fruit and your fruit shall not wither and whatever you do for God shall prosper. Now, I need you to say, Holy Spirit... I receive the grace to be sanctified, to be preserved, to bring forth fruit, and to prosper at whatever you tell me to do. Now receive that grace now in the name of Jesus Christ. And clap your hands and tell the Lord thank you as you come into an agreement with the grace to prosper in the midst of a decaying society. Just because everybody around you is dying does not mean you have to die. Just because everybody is falling apart does not mean you must fall apart. You are different. You are sanctified. You are like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Your leaf will not wither, and whatever you do, it shall prosper. Somebody shout, I'm different. I'm different. That's what I want you to get out of this. And we're going to ask you to turn the monitors up a little bit, please. I'm different. Say it again. I'm different. The teacher's testimony plays a central role in the sanctification and preservation 
process in our life. And so for this reason, we want to talk about this testimony. And I'm going to ask you to work with this mic. It really sounds funny. Everybody say the testimony of Jesus. Now I need you to remember the testimony of Jesus is the evidence, there that's better, is the evidence of his life displayed in what he does for a person and what he does through a person. Where is the testimony of Jesus? Is whatever he's doing, everybody say for people. And whatever he is doing through people. And be reminded that wherever a testimony is, if it is received, then those individuals will be blessed and they will advance. If the testimony through a person is rejected, then they are going to suffer loss and a penalty. And so testimonies are very, very powerful. They are literally like God's ordinances in the earth. If you become a testimony, you literally become a law in the earth that's meant to regulate activity. We've already discussed how Jesus reveals himself through the apostle, the testimony of the apostle. We talked about the testimony of the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. We talked about the testimony of the ministry of helps. We've discussed the testimony of miracles and the intercessors. And someone said, Bishop, you forgot about the testimony of the teacher. And so I did. I wasn't even going to do the teacher. <laughs> but because somebody said it, I said, let's go back and get the teacher now. So today's message, everybody say the teacher's testimony. We're going to look at and examine how God utilizes the teacher. Now, it's, it's, it, the text we're using is in St. John chapter 17, and there we're going to make three points to unpack this truth. Point number one, we're going to discuss true glory. Say it with me, true glory. Point number two, we're going to discuss sanctification. Everybody say it, sanctification. And finally, point number three, we're going to deal with the teacher's testimony. Now, I want to look at the first point and talk about true glory. Um, it's in the 17th chapter that our Lord is praying what is called his high priestly prayer. It is probably the most austere moment that we can peer into. In his humanity, he is actually talking to God prior to his crucifixion. And everything that he could pray at this moment, out of everything he could pray, he thought to pray about true glory. He thought to pray about sanctification. Those were his two prayer points. And he says a number of things that we don't have time to uh, enumerate today, but I want to deal with true glory. So first of all, he, he notice what he says in verse number one. Read it with me, everybody. He says, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and, and said, what does he say? Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. And now I want you to skip down to verse number four. He says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gave me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self and with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Now watch me. So he's concerned, he's praying about being glorified. The word glory in the Greek is the word doxa. And that word simply means uh, the opinion that God has of a thing. 
if it's, uh, it means its true essence, its true weight. It means seeing something as it really is from heaven. He says, I need you to glorify me so that I can glorify you. What he's actually praying is, I need you to allow them to see me as I am. I need you to allow them to see why I really came to earth. Because if they don't see me as I am, then, they, then I can never get them to see you for who you are. Jesus says, I need you to glorify me. Isn't it strange how people can see a person but find it difficult to see them for who they really are in God? Is something stymie about that or something sinister about the ability to see a person and yet not see them for who God has ordained for them to be. What is that handicap in the human race that can easily see what's wrong but struggle to see the things that are right and godly with the person? Even Jesus who was God in flesh, spoke to his disciples on one occasion and said, whom do men say that I am? And they were confused even among themselves. And now here he is at the end of his life, he's still praying the one prayer, Lord, I need you to let them see me as I am because if they don't see me, then I can't get them to see you. This is the sole purpose that I actually came to the earth. I've spent almost three years with these people and they don't even really know why I came. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, it's almost like uh, the Zulu greeting that we talk about here so often. You know, it's called Sawabona. Sawabona, the Zulus greet one another like this and look at your neighbor and say Sawabona. Sawabona so, so just simply means I see you. But, but it doesn't mean I see you physically. Yeah, that's, everybody can see you physically. But it means I really see your gifts. I see your worth. I see your weight. I see your talents. I see you why you're here in the earth. I see you for real, your purpose. I see your importance. That's how they greet one another in that language. And then their response in the English is, I exist because you see me. I exist in your world because you see me. You know what that really means? That means that people can only exist in your world to the degree that you see them. It is possible to have a mighty person next to you, but if you only see their mistakes, then the mistakes are the only thing that will exist in your world. It is possible to forfeit the wealth in your life and the opportunity that God has given you in human resources if you never can see a person for who they are. Frankly stated, there are people around you right now sitting next to you that are a wealth of knowledge and character right next to you. But if you only see them according to their mistake or if you only see them according to their history or if you only notice their shoes they're wearing or the dress they have on, then you're forfeiting the wealth that God has sent to be in your life. Ladies and gentlemen, people can only exist in your world to the degree that you see them. And so this is why so many marriage relationships struggle because the truth is husbands and wives many on many occasions never 
fully see each other. They remember the pain that they've hurt, that they incurred in the relationship, and that's through the, that's the lens that they look at the person through. But the fact of the matter, say there's more to me. There's more to me than what meets the eye. Glory to God. And this is why we have to pray the prayer. Father, glorify me so they can see me for who I am so that I can benefit them. You have been placed in some people's lives to be a benefit to them, but they they can't benefit from you being in their lives because they don't see you. There are people that, that, that see me even right now and, and, and my life has been a benefit for them. But then there's some other folks right next to me that can't see me and they're wondering why you are all excited about this guy and I'm not excited about him at all. And he's the same guy. What's the problem? The truth is you don't see me and they do. That's why they get what they get. Are you hearing me ladies and you know how long I had to say God glorify me so they can see me in this church it took years for some to get a glimpse of who I am as a man of God and some still don't have a clue it's not just me the same is true of all around you they don't see you they only look on the outward appearance and they don't benefit they pray to God for a blessing and you are their blessing that God has put in their life but because they don't see you they can't get what God has ordained for your life their life and this is why we got to pray Lord glorify me so they can see me Somebody say, Lord, glorify me. That means cause them to see my worth, my weight, my true essence from your vantage point. This is the key to leadership. This is the key to a successful household. You can go to every marriage seminar you want and learn how to put logs on the fire and buy some skivvies to wear. That ain't gonna change your marriage. The problem is how they see you. You can put all that stuff on and they still see you the same way. Are you hearing me? What has to happen is they need a new verdict in their heart about you. Once you've made a judgment on a person, you never are objective from that day forward. You are only gonna see them through the lens of your judgment about them. If somebody's gonna see you differently, they gotta change their judgment about you so their eyes can open up and see you as you are. The reason that they didn't want you on the team is because they saw you. Had nothing to do with your talent. The reason that they treat you like they treat you is because the way they see you. They put Jesus on the cross because the way they saw him had nothing to do with who he was. It was their perception of him. And so perception rules the world, even if it's not true. And so we have to learn to manage perception and do our best. And this is Jesus attempting to manage perception. He's not saying glorify me because I just want to be great. He's saying glorify me so they can see me. Because if they see me, then I can get them to see you and if people are going to see God they're going to have to first see God in you that old flawed doctrine that people have preached for years saying that people are not supposed to see you and you're just trying to get them to see Jesus you're mixed up because they're not going to see Jesus unless they can see Jesus in you first one of the keys and one of the things that really makes a thing work is when they can see somebody in you. Somebody say amen. You remember when Peter and John was at the gate called Beautiful and there was a lame man there. He was lame from his mother's womb and he looked, looked and he expected to receive. They said, look on 
us. Then they said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. If they look on you and don't see Jesus, they're probably not going to rise up and walk when you tell them to get up. Are you hearing me? So you can't say my lifestyle doesn't matter. If I'm here to be an ambassador and represent Jesus, they got to see Jesus in me so I can get them to see God up in heaven. Are you hearing me? My lifestyle does matter if I'm trying to get people to see Jesus. But somebody say amen. amen. And so true glory is when they're able to see you as God sees you or see you according to God's design for your life. And the more they see you or the better they see, the more they will benefit from you. It's possible to be married to a very powerful person and not benefit from that person if you don't see them right. Look at somebody and say, can you see me? Can you see me? <laughs> It's to your advantage because I'm the answer to your prayers. You just don't know that. <laughs> yes. And so true glory is coming. Somebody say true glory is coming. Really it is. True glory is coming. Uh, the visibility is coming. God's going to cause people to begin to see you all of a sudden. They're going to see you. Jesus had disciples that walked with him for a long time, but the Bible says they didn't believe on him until the wedding at Cana. They didn't, so people can walk with you, but it doesn't mean, don't mean they believe on you. People can say they're your friends, but it don't mean they believe anything you're talking about. You got to know the difference between those that believe versus those that just hanging around. When you move from hang people who hang around you to people who believe in you, that's a whole different ball game. And there's always something you have to do. There's a work that you must do in order to open up their eyes. Jesus had to turn the water into wine before they believed on him. And here he has to go to Calvary. When he goes to the cross, people are going to see him. I need you to know there is a work connected, a predetermined work that God has tied to your life that's going to cause people to begin to see you. As long as you say, look at me, but you don't do nothing, they're never going to see you. But if you do what God told you to do, when you do the work that was predetermined for you to do before the foundation of the world, see, God gives us all work to do. And the more you do the work, the more they see who you are. As soon as you do some of those things God told you to do, people are going to see you as God ordained for you to be. You can get a website. You can get somebody to brand you. But if you don't do the work, they still ain't going to see you. They're just going to see your brand, see your website. You can get all the people to like your stuff. That don't mean they see you. That don't mean they see you at all. But the moment you do what God told you to do, that's when people's eyes will open up and have a double take and then they won't just see you they will believe in you and God told me to tell you we're moving into another place now I feel that we're getting ready to move into a level where folks are going to start believing in us it's not enough for them just to believe in God for things to happen they got to believe in you for things to happen and when you get a family that believes in God and they believe in in one another the miraculous is going to break out in that kind of family that's what's hurting families they believe in God but they don't believe in one another that's why things aren't working the way it's supposed to work husbands and wife believe in God but they don't believe in one another you got people in your company that believe in God but they don't believe in one another but God told me there's a shift coming to the body of Christ we are getting ready to do some works that's going to cause people to believe in us and when we start believing in one another in this house my God 
God, the supernatural, the miraculous, the anything kind of possible day will take place in your life. You think it's just your faith in God that's going to make it happen? Jesus says, believe in God, but believe also in me. When you believe in each other, there is nothing that can stop God from working in your life. I declare a brand new day where we believe in each other and mighty things happen in our life. Somebody say amen, amen, amen. Look at somebody and say, do you believe in me yet? That's what it's about. Every husband needs to go home and ask your wife, do you believe in me yet? Every wife has to ask her husband, do you believe in me yet? Have I been so long with you and you don't believe in me yet? <laughs> Hallelujah. What else do I got to do to convince you of who I am? Do you think I'm just in, you think I'm just an average person? Do you really know who you're married to? Do you really know who your brother is? Do you really know who your sister is? Don't you know I stepped out of heaven and I'm incognito as a bus driver, but I'm really from heaven? Do you really know who I am? We must come to a place where we believe in each other. I'm telling you, everything will change. That's the one thing that's hindering movement. Athletic teams win championships when the players believe in each other. When the fans believe in their team. It's all about faith, not just upward, but outward. Lift those hands and let's worship for a minute. You know what kids do when they know their parents believe in them? When a son thinks his daddy believes in him? Do you know what that son will do when somebody believes in them? It changes the game for them. Somebody has to believe in you in order for you to really release yourself, in order for those gifts to really come out of you, in order for you really to have the boldness you need. It's not enough. I know we're used to saying, I'm going to believe in myself regardless if nobody believes in me. Okay, you can have that testimony, but I'm on the other side. I'm not only going to believe in myself, but I'm looking for some other folks to also believe in me. Because when you get a crowd to believe in you, nothing will be impossible. This is why he prays the prayer. Lord, glorify your son so they can see me and believe in me so I can get them to see and believe in you. Powerful prayer point. Everybody say true glory, true glory. is when they see you through the lens of God. And so I want to encourage you to work and do what you need to do to get that woman to believe. Hey Amen. That, that's what makes everything work is belief. I promise you, I'm going to move on, but I, I, I need you to understand we're running down the wrong track. The reason why it's not working, they don't believe in you. That's the issue. Why are they giving me so much trouble in this meeting? Because they don't believe in you. Why are they resisting me? They don't believe. And you can run after every smoking gun you want. It's one thing. Because when they believe, they'll tolerate a whole lot of stuff. When they believe, they'll tolerate your mistakes. When they believe, you can mess up and they'll be gracious. When they don't believe, you can do everything right ten times and mess up a half a day. And they're done with you. Because they were just waiting for something to happen so they could express their disgruntled state anyway. 
they never believed in you. That's why he says, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. That start, that's the first thing we have to do. God says, if you don't do that, ain't no sense in us playing. Oh my God, first point, let's move. <laughs> Too much time with that one. And so, Jesus prayed that prayer, that he would be glorified. He said, with the glory that he had before the foundation of the earth. He wanted them to see the fullness of him. He wasn't plain. Then he moves to another prayer point, and I'm cutting and pacing a bit. He moves to the next prayer point, which is sanctification. And I want you to see this. Uh, sanctification, starting at verse number 13. We will read it in just a moment, but we read some of it at the outset of the message. Verse 17, he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. But I want you to know what sanctification is all about and why it is important. Sanctification in the original language means apartness. It means to be separated unto God. Anytime something is sanctified, it is separated to God. If this mic was sanctified to God only, that means only God could use it. It's separated unto him. If anybody else used it, it is no longer sanctified. It is called defiled. So sanctification means you're separated unto God and it also connotes the ideal of holiness because once you're separated from evil or separated from dirt or separated from darkness, then you become kadosh in the Hebrew, which is holy. The word holy means that you're no longer imperfect in any kind of way if we're talking practical holiness. That means you're completely separated. But listen carefully to me. Sanctification, I want to talk about two types of sanctifications. Number one, we're going to talk about positional sanctification. Say it with me. Positional sanctification. Then two, we need to talk about practical sanctification. Say it. Practical it's going to be good. Just listen. Positional sanctification says that I am perfect based on Christ's offering on my behalf. Jesus represents me in heaven perfectly. And so I am positionally separated unto God and holy before God. That's my position. Everybody say I'm holy before God positionally. Based upon the Lord's offering. But Jesus here is not talking about positional sanctification. He's talking about practical sanctification, which means how much of my life has truly been separated unto God experientially. Though I am accepted in the beloved, though I, my name is written in heaven and Jesus represents me perfect, God is still concerned about how much of my natural life is actually separated unto God. That's called, everybody say it, practical sanctification. Now, why is this important? The reason, the primary reason is because separation unto a thing leads to expertise. It leads to, everybody say expertise. Understand that, who was it? Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book about uh, 10,000 hours that's needed for a person to become an expert in an area. He says if you spend 10,000 hours practicing the piano and you have a gift for that, you can become a, what is he really saying? If you be sanctified to that. If you spend 10,000 hours shooting a basketball and you have a gift for that and a knack for that, you can become a great player, according to him. Now, it varies. I think some people need more time than others. But the point he's making is, in order for a person to become good or great at something, you need to separate yourself unto that thing. 
No one can become an expert in anything that you don't give yourself over to. And so Jesus praying, watch it now, that these disciples become sanctified. He's not just trying to get them to beat the back out of a tambourine and call themselves a sanctified church and run around. That's not what he has in mind. He don't mind you doing that, but that has nothing to do with sanctification. He wants to see them dedicate themselves to something in God to the degree where they can become an expert at it. He says, I'm about to leave this earth and I'm going to leave you all in charge and I need you boys to become experts at communicating God to the people or demonstrating God to the people. And so you must, his prayer point was that they would all be sanctified. Now I'm trying to put it in a different light. So you can see it is not just some church thing when we talk about sanctification. Uh, but, uh, but if God has called you to do something, you must give yourself over to it completely. You have to give yourself over to him and you have to give yourself over to the task that God has given you. And if you do so, what's the result? Everybody say expertise. You are going to see experts begin to rise in the house of God when people are truly sanctified. One of the signs that people are not sanctified is people function in an average kind of way. They've been called to the prophetic for years and they're still just in that same area. It's really because they haven't dedicated themselves to God or to the call. God has not intended for any of us to be average in an area that we're supposed to be experts in. And when you're supposed to be an expert in an area, he's going to require time, ladies and gentlemen. And so the Holy Ghost told me he's making a call for time right now. He's running through everybody's life because we need experts in this day. Anytime you need experts, God says, I need time then. If you want expertise, I want time. When will God bring experts? When we give God the time that, we, that, that it takes to become an expert. And so God is running through people's lives and saying, see those three hours that you dedicate to running your mouth on the phone? I want that time. God said, you see that time that you're using to watch television, those same old raggedy shows? I want that time. God says, see all that time you spending over there talking about people? Give me that time. I promise you, God is asking for time in this season right now. Because in order to lift the church to the next level, it's not going to happen with average people. It's only going to happen with experts in the kingdom of God. No longer can you just be ordinary and we're going to fight the devil in this day. No, our skill was for yesterday. But in order for us to fight the devils of the day, we all, I told you, we got to step it up, step it up. We got to go to another place in him. And so God says, can I have your time? You know that time that you spend sleeping all day because you off work that day? God says, give me four of them hours. God says, I want some time. You know that time that you spend lollygagging at the gym? Work out at the gym for an hour and a half and get your butt out of there and then get into prayer. It don't take four hours at the gym to work out. You just wasting time. God says he's after all the time wasters in our life right now because he says it was my time in the beginning and I gave the time to you. Now I'm calling for it back so I can sanctify you in this season. We are are in a day where the Lord is about to sanctify his people on another level so that he can make us experts in the field that he has called us to walk in. I declare a day of sanctification on this house now in Jesus name. Somebody clap your hands right there. 
and say, Lord, I give you permission to sanctify me. Come on, tell him. Holy Ghost, I give you permission to take some of my time. Glory to God. You know all that time you spend feeling sorry for yourself? God says, give me that time. You know all that time you spend just sitting there dub, dozing off? God says, give me that time. I want your time so that I can get you to become an expert in your area. Shout time, time, time. We must streamline our life in this season so God can have his time. You who say that I don't have time to pray, I don't even have a response right now. And so, let me hurry here. So, so, so what he's doing is he wants to sanctify us. Everybody say sanctification. It's a matter of creating experts. That's all it's really about. And so he wants to sanctify you to him and he wants to sanctify you to the craft. And your life is going to shift in an incredible way. I watched my life shift after COVID in an incredible way. I'm only telling you what he told me. It was during the COVID season, and you've heard me say this, that we, had, we were all shut down. I said, Lord, what am I going to do with this time? He says, give it to me. And I spent hours before God in study and in prayer during that season. And I watched God perfect some things in me. It's all about how much time you spend with it. All of us have the potential of, of being an expert in some area. All of us have an ability to find our voice and to really have an impact on our environment. Every person in this room can release their voice on a higher level and can cause great things to happen. No one was meant to be average your whole life. The challenge is you just haven't spent enough time with the right thing. And if you make a decision today that you're going to allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify you and dedicate you to God. I mean you say I'm going to give God this percentage of my day I guarantee you in six months you will not be at the same level that you are at you can listen to everybody's prophecy but if there's no time spent with it nothing is going to happen you can come to church and get happy but if there's no time spent with the principle that God put in your spirit nothing is going to happen ladies and gentlemen we need experts we need experts real bad in this Day because we've got all kind of problems that are stumping us but God said the answers are in the people I just need them to come up here and let me work with them for longer than two hours in a service I want them for four hours I want them for three hours I want them in my prayer closet for five hours so I can make them miracle workers so I can make them heal so I can make them better fathers, so I can make them better husbands, so I can make them what the world has never seen. I've got some ideas for their life, and if they come, I'll turn them into stars. Yeah, clap those hands right there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is anybody going to come? Is anybody going to heed this call? I need to know before I move on, is anybody going to heed this call and give God time? In closing, the goal, the prayer point is sanctification. And in verse number 14, let's read together, put it on the screen. In verse number 14, he says, read everybody, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them. Why? Because they are not of the world, even as I am 
not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest do what? Keep them from, watch you be redundant. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am. And here it is, sanctify them through thy truth. So what is he saying? You have to be sanctified to your purpose. You have to be sanctified to the, the words you're supposed to speak. You have to be sanctified to everything he's ordained for your life. You got to give yourself over to it. I remember when God taught me some things through the sanctification. I'm going to talk about it in just a moment, but I want to give you the key to sanctification. This is what will cause you to be sanctified. It is the testimony of the teacher. It is the teacher that God uses to help with sanctification. I know you might would think it would be the apostle. The apostle will help if he is an apostolic teacher. The prophet will help if she's an apostolic or he's an apost or a prophetic teacher. But if there is no teacher involved, there's not going to be a whole lot of sanctification. Because the Greek word for teacher is the, 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 the gospel. Uh, the, 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 the gospel, and what it means is someone who triggers learning. A teacher is someone that can get other people to learn. So they do it by two things. Number one, providing information, and number two, modeling what they are to become. A teacher is a one who models what they're trying to learn and provide information. So teaching is not just telling. Teaching is, also, is triggering their understanding so that they can learn. Just because a person has information does not mean they know a thing. Just, you can tell, you can say, I told them kids to stop running. Yeah, you did, but you didn't teach them not to run. There's a difference between telling them not to run and teaching them not to run. I told those kids they should go to church. Yeah, but you didn't teach them to go to church. They must not only have the information, see, in order to go to church, there's a certain disposition that they have to learn. There's a certain mentality that they have to experience. Teachers give people an experience in the thing that they are trying to do. Not just with word, but with modeling. In other words, watch me do it. If you're going to teach somebody, you got to say, get in the yoke with me and watch me cast the devil out. And you learn how by watching me do it and me giving you information. If it's just a class where I teach you intellectually how to cast out a devil, that's not teaching. That's only one half of it. But if you can show a person that's when you're really teaching. And so we need teachers today to rise up in this time to model what people need to experience and to give them the data or the information. Because what does teaching do? Teaching brings them into the truth. Teaching, he says, you're going to be sanctified in the Truth and the teacher is trying to get them to experience the truth. Jesus learned obedience by the things he, in other words, you got to have an experience with something in order to learn it. Not just information, you got to experience it to learn it. God, been, he, and, and teaching is a process. It, it doesn't happen because you sit in a class. It's a process. It takes time for it to click. You can be working with a kid for years trying to get one lesson in them. And somewhere along the way, it clicks. And they finally see it. You've talked about it. You've modeled it. You've given them experience. And one day, it unlocks for them. A teacher will stick with the person until it unlocks in their mind. And God knows we need more teachers today because there's some things that people can't do because they've never been taught. There's a reason that people are not doing certain things. No one ever taught them to do it. 
I was talking to, listening to one of my spiritual mentors one time, and we were inquiring as to why his church was operating a certain way, and he said it's a matter of teaching. He said the people over there do it that way because they simply haven't been taught. But if you hang around people who are modeling greatness, you will pick up greatness in your spirit because it's set before you. Are you hearing me? A teacher is going to model your next level before you. This is why mamas can't be their kids' friends and hang out on their level because you're not teaching them anything good. We need a mama that can stand out front and say, this is what a woman looks like when she's 35. I ain't got to say it to you, just watch me. We need a father to model before his grandchildren. That's what I try to do. Every time my grandkids see me while walking up to a door with my wife, I open the door for her because it's me but I'm also saying do you see how a man must treat a woman you've got to model what you want people to do that's what teaching is all about you can't cuss the pastor out at home and expect the kids to love on the pastor in public because you've modeled how to handle yourself as a hypocrite in the church they, they pick up what they see more than what they hear if you want people to do something you gotta model it before them and real teachers model their message before the people somebody shall teach me teach me teach me teachers are the ones that God will use to bring us into sanctification teachers do that Teachers, are, their whole role is to get you into truth. I know the prophet prophesied about the truth. And I know the apostle declared it. And I know the pastor's wiping your nose when you snot and your eyes when you cry. But I want you to model. I want you, I want to show you what it looks like. Watch my life. Watch me do it. Do you see it? Now let me see you try to do it. Watch me do it. Now let me watch you do it. That's what a teacher does. And if we had more models in the house, anything is possible now let's clap our hands for teachers come on clap our hands for teachers if you've had any teachers in your life who has some teachers in your life who taught you how to be a woman who taught you how to be a man? Who taught you how to give your tithe? Who taught you how to praise God? Who taught you how to sacrifice? You don't just know that by reading a book. You got to watch somebody else sacrifice and the spirit of sacrifice will rub off on you. Who taught you how to stand up in the midst of a storm? You got to see somebody else stand up in the midst of a storm. Who taught you how to do it my God when you've been taught you will learn your eyes will open up and God told me to tell you some of you are about to have an epiphany right now we're going to see a whole lot of people click all of a sudden they're going to say I got the message after all these years I finally got the message and when they get the message everything in their life will begin to change God told me to tell you you are about to click on another level because somebody is teaching you the right stuff. Somebody say amen in this house. So the testimony of the teacher is the one that shows the model for what everything is supposed to be and provide information that cause people to learn. And that's what sanctifies you. You can pray to get deliverance from your flesh and walk in bondage. But when it clicks, it can no longer hold you again. You can pray for the devil's power to cease, but he's going to continue to mess with you until something clicks 
in your mind. It's got to click before you start saying, hey, I ain't got to fight this devil like this no more. God has given me the victory. You heard that message your whole life, but all of a sudden, that thing clicked in your spirit, and you just walk right past the devil. When you really get the message, then it happens for you. And God says, you are about to get the message. It's about to happen in your life. Tell somebody it's getting ready to click. I'm getting ready to click. Tell somebody I'm getting ready to click. Say it again. I'm getting ready to click. When I click, watch out for me. Everybody on your feet. Come here, Jeff. No, that Jeff, yeah. No, you, Jeff, yes. I'm giving you an opportunity. It's your call. If you get in the yoke with me, you've tried all kinds of things to do what you want to do and go where you need to go and get what you're after. And that's a beautiful effort. But the only challenge is you haven't been in the yoke with somebody who knows the way. If you get in the yoke, that means you follow my teachings that God has given me. You follow my example. You can't be running all around every other place, but you give me a year. I promise you, you give me a year where you're focused this way. Single focus. Watch my life. Watch my way. What I study, you study. What I preach about, you go home and study. We have conversation about it. And we walk. If I'll keep walking, I'm walking, you walk. We walk. We walk. Somewhere on the journey, it's going to click. <laughs> Remember Neil on the Matrix? Did you, you a Matrix guy? See, I am. See, you're supposed to be. No, I'm not. No, no. Neil on the Matrix was trying to dodge bullets. But somewhere, it clicked. And he said, I ain't got to dodge the bullets. The bullets aren't even real. He just put his hand up and he caught him and he stopped it. Something's getting ready to click in your life. If you follow me as I follow Christ, something's going to click on another level. And all that stuff that's in you, all that destiny that's in you, all that calling that's in you, all those gifts that are in you, all those prayers that have been prayed are going to just explode in your life once it clicks in your mind. And then people are going to see you as you are. And it's going to be a game changer. And you wanted people to believe in you. And people are going to believe in you on another level. You must decide whether you want to follow this example of sainthood. I'm kind of boring. If hanging out with God is something you don't want to do, that's what I do. I do other stuff too, but that's my primary job. If you want to do that, then we're going to have a whole lot of fun together. Maybe the first month might be hard on you. But once you get into it, there's something in the deep in you calling to something in the deep to God. Lift your hands, Jeff.
Hallelujah. Somebody say, sanctify me, Lord. Sanctify me, Lord. If you're sanctified, you will become an expert at something for God. Everybody must be an expert. Say it. Everybody must be an expert. All you need is a teacher. Can you tell somebody to follow you as you follow Christ? You have to really be able to say that. They don't know the way. Follow me then. And they really see Christ in your ambassadorship. Glory to his name. If you're here today and you want this Jesus, I need you to get to the altar now. If you want a teacher in your life, the only reason why you haven't flown to the high level is because you don't have a teacher. That's the only reason why certain things haven't worked. You know you're gifted. You know you have what it takes. So what's hindering? No teacher. Get to the altar right now. Say, I need a teacher. I need a teacher. The testimony of the teacher is Christ in our midst, modeling what should be, modeling everything. I didn't get a chance to finish the message. But the testimony of Christ is him modeling before us and sanctifying us to the truth. Come on, get up here right now. Come on up. Come on up. Tell them I want a teacher. Join the church if you're not a part. You got to connect. You have to connect. A teacher is someone that's in your life. I know school teachers are people who teach you during a certain time period, but the teacher in the kingdom is somebody that's in your life. It's a whole different ball game. Come on, who else is here? If you know that you are a teacher in ministry, I want you to line up back there. Line up in the front, but back here. If you know you're a teacher, I mean called to the office of the teacher. I want you to line up, because we need teachers. Everybody who wants prayer, come up here. The teachers we want right there, lined up. Altar workers, you got to help because some are still coming for prayer. Make sure the ones that want prayer get through.
Okay, those of you that are here, that are teachers, and you guys at the altar, keep praying, keep ministering, but to those of you that are teachers, I want to speak to you. God has said something in the church. He said, first, apostles. He said, secondly, prophets. And he said, thirdly, teachers. He wasn't talking about somebody that, that could just teach a class. Because everybody in the kingdom should be able to teach something. But he was talking about somebody who was dedicated to, to allowing a pupil to get in the yoke with them and model before them the way while instructing them. It's both modeling and classical teaching if you only teach and don't model then you've disqualified yourself as a bona fide five-fold ministry teacher that means you can't teach and disappear they have to be a part of your life class teachers have a life class Jesus says take my yoke upon you then he said, and learn of me. You can't learn unless you take on the, so how do you know when somebody's ready to learn? They'll get in the yoke with you. If they say they want you to teach them, but they never get in the yoke with you, they never pick up your burden, they never say they want to walk with you with, your, with the work you're called to do, they're not ready to learn. You're wasting your... Those are the students that are ready to learn. You know why public school teachers are having a hard time with teaching the kids? Because the, some of the teachers aren't modeling their message and, and some of the kids aren't willing to get in the yoke. There's a relationship problem between the student and the teacher. When there's a relationship problem between the student and the teacher, learning won't take place. There has to be a connection. Your ministry is needed now more than ever because God says, when I want to sanctify people, I call the teachers. And you got to walk people out of places where they are into new places. They got to eat where you're grazing. You don't have to change what you're doing. This is what delivered me, so let's walk. This is what saved me, so let's walk. You already have your message. You are your message. You just have to be willing to walk people out of their stuff. Is that who you guys are? I'm going to ask those of you that are part of this church, if you're a real teacher, you know, and you really feel you have a call to the five-fold ministry, you need to call the office and become a part of our ministry staff. You need to be a part. If you want to do it personally, you can. But I'm encouraging you to get in the yoke here because it'll only strengthen what you're doing. I want to pray for you now. I'm going to ask you all hold hands with each other. Repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I commit myself to you the chief teacher the chief instructor the model I sanctify myself to my calling and my reason for being in the earth Glorify me so people can see me through your eyes that I might cause them to see you. I receive the grace to walk with people into freedom by instruction. This is different than deliverance. A deliverer will set you free. 
A teacher will help make you free. I will walk with you until you transform. Say it. I am a teacher in the kingdom of God. I receive grace, responsibility, the anointing to get the job done. Now by apostolic authority, I declare that you will cause learning to unlock. You will unlock understanding. You will be like Jesus. Take them out as far as Bethany and open up their understanding. The grace to open understanding be on you now in Jesus' name. Ooh. 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 Hallelujah. I said the grace to open understanding be on you now in Jesus' name. Now I want you to pray for the hand that you're holding right now. Pray for that person next to you. Glory to God. You pray for them. Hallelujah. Pray that we get a whole lot of folks sanctified. All those people that really want to walk with God but just don't know the way. Pray that we get a hold of them and get them sanctified. All of those lost coins in the house. Pray that we get a hold of those lost coins and get them sanctified. All those people on the outside that would come in but they don't think they can do it. Pray that we get a hold of them and walk them into this great blessing. That we model love, model peace, model kindness, model what you want them to be. That you become the message that you declare to them. In the name of the Lord, I declare the rise of the teacher in Jesus' mighty name. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be an apostle. But you do need to be a teacher. receive our offering at this time and those of you who want to stay for communion we're going to go right into our communion service those of you that don't you can be dismissed after the offering but we're going to receive our offering right now in the name of the Lord there's the QR code and you can uh, do what you need to do follow the promptings and give your offerings but everybody else, I want you to get prepared to bring that offering. We're going to educate people in God. That's what we're going to do. Stuff is getting ready to click on another level. Hallelujah. My God, my God. Hallelujah. It's going to click. You're not going to keep going around that same old tree. Something's going to click in your life. You can't be what you've never seen. You just can't be what you never saw model. That's just the way it is. You can't do it. You can read about it all day, but until you see it, it's not going to click. That's why you're in a blessed place right now, because we got a whole lot of models in this house, a lot of teachers. I want you to prepare to give. Father, we pray you would bless these gifts in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray you would multiply them for your glory. We pray, oh God, there would be an increase in their life. Give back to them a thousand times more because they trust you in the name of Jesus. We command blessing on every giver and every household. 
in Jesus' name, amen. You're in the hands of the ushers right now. Please call. Please, please come with those gifts. opportunity to participate in what we call Holy Communion, which is a time of reaffirming our faith and our confidence in the covenant that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord taught us to do this often because the more you do it, the greater 
strength we're able to receive in him. As a matter of fact, in the first book of Corinthians, chapter number 11, Paul writes, For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup and when he had sup, saying, this cup is the New Testament or new covenant in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Notice the terminology, for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death until he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. To receive this unworthily simply means that someone is taking communion, but they have no intentions on being in covenant with God. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It just means that you have no intentions on being in covenant with him. When you're not perfect and you take the blood, it strengthens you so you can overcome. That's why it says as often as you look at this, you show his price that he paid and the strength of the covenant until he comes. And so he took the bread and he raised it and he blessed it. The bread represents his body. Everybody say his body. That was broken for us. His body was offered as a ransom. It was a sacrifice. His body represented, number one, the coming together of the body of Christ with no divisions. His body represented gifts mantles, everything that God had in his body, he wants in our life. His body was the temple and the glory rested in him and on him. And today I feel the need to believe God for greater temple, to become a greater temple before God. He was the perfect temple. And when we partake of this, we're saying as he is, so are we. So I want somebody to believe God to be a better temple for God and that greater power will rest on us when we declare that we are his body in the name of the Lord. And also we learn that with his stripes we were healed. And so God, we dedicate these elements where they indeed become the body of Jesus Christ. He also took the cup and he raised it. And he said, this is the New Testament in my blood. He called it a cup of blessing. He called it the new covenant. The blood itself represents the life of God. Everybody say the life of God. It was his life that was offered to God on our behalf in perfection that gave us positional holiness and positional sanctification. We are perfect before God because Jesus' blood represents us. Your name is written in heaven because he represents you there. But the blood also represents the forgiveness of sin. It was part of the price that was paid. It washed us from all iniquity so that we would have no guilt in our life. And I'm praying right now when you partake of this that you believe God for the removal of all guilt and shame. Guilt says I did wrong. Shame says I am wrong. But the blood can wash the guilt and the shame out of our life. Ooh, glory to God. And so we're going to believe God for the cleansing of guilt and shame when we partake of this cup today. It was also called a cup of blessing. That means his wisdom, his knowledge, his understanding, everything he is, his life becomes our life. He that is born of God becomes one life. So whatever you need, you can get it through his life. Is life eternal? Life minus time. Father, we pray for these elements where they indeed will become the blood of Jesus. 
and we would share one life with him and all of our sins would be forgiven and guilt and shame would be washed out of our life. We declare it so in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a few different elements today. It's a little different. Uh, this time you're going to have to take the lid off of it and partake. And so we're going to ask you to stand, please, and where you are. And you're in the hands of the ushers. And they're going to direct you from the rear of the house. And we want you to come in faith.
coming up the elements if you have it. And we want you to raise the bread up before the Lord. And I need you to believe God to become a more sanctified temple. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary pure and holy, tried and true. That's what we're going to believe God for because the greater the sanctification, the greater the glory. The greater the sanctification, the greater the glory. The greater the practical sanctification, the greater the glory. Every time we go up another notch, the glory increases and people see you more because you're more sanctified to what you're called to. You're closer to being the truth that you were meant to be. Sanctification is walking us into the truth. He's guiding us into all truth. Holy Ghost is the teacher, and then there are teachers that come, but all teach by the Holy Ghost. Woo, glory to God. So Lord, show me somebody at the level where I need to go in the area I'm trying to sanctify in. Whatever area you're trying to sanctify in, you need a model. You need a teacher. If there's no teacher, then the Holy Ghost is going to have to teach you. But he'll find somebody to put before you that's walking at that level. Glory to God. I want you to believe God for another level of sanctification for your sanctuary that you are. Oh God, I see another level and I see another level in him. Another level of consecration. Greater the expertise, greater the glory, greater the power. Repeat after me, praise be unto Adonai. Our God, ruler of the universe, who commands the ground to bring forth bread by faith, this is the body of Christ. Receive it and be blessed. Thank you, Jesus, for sanctification. Thank you for the models showing up in our life. Thank you for the Holy Ghost inspiration that we're going to get every day because we pray this prayer. Ooh, glory to God. Thank you, oh God, for the expertise that's breaking. Thank you for things clicking. Thank you for new levels of learning. Thank you for brilliancy in God. Oh God. Thank you for all ignorance being defeated all lack of knowledge being defeated thank you for higher teaching higher learning in the things of God Woo, higher learning in the things of God Woo, higher learning in the things of God thank you for an advanced course in the things of God oh God thank you for that high level oh Ria Rabasha Hallelujah. Hold that cup up before the Lord. This is the blood of the covenant. This is what substantiates everything. This is the proof that we're one with Christ. This is the signature of God on our life. This is the forgiveness of sins. This is the breaking of guilt and shame. Woo, glory to God. This is the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah, this is the blood of Jesus that breaks the yoke of Satan. Satan is afraid of the life of Jesus. Let me become a walking rebuke to Satan. Let me become so full of the life of Jesus that my life is a walking rebuke to the devil without me even opening up my mouth. In the name of the Lord, let me be so full of him. Hallelujah. Repeat after me, praise be unto Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, who commands the vines to yield grapes by faith. This is the blood of the covenant. 
receive it and become one with God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now believe God for that strength, new strength, new life. I've come that you might have life. Believe God for a new level of life right now, a new level of learning, a new level of education in him. Believe God for the teacher to show up in your life, the strength to walk in the yoke, the grace to do what you could not do. Believe God for expertise, gifts and talents and abilities in the name of the Lord. Believe him for a holy life. Let the grace of holiness come upon us now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Take a little time out and worship him before we stop and make some declarations over your life right now. Decree a thing and it shall be established. It's a covenant right. Claim your covenant rights right now. Whatever you have a right to, declare it out of your mouth right now. Rosha. Hallelujah. I said declare it out of your mouth right now. Open up your mouth. This is that prophetic moment and say a thing. You have the right to declare it and believe it. can wash away my sins nothing but the blood of Jesus hallelujah thank you Lord for this sweet communion of the Holy Ghost let us be better as a result of it Lord I pray your blessing on everybody in the house right now may the blessing of well-being be our portion may the blessing of preservation be our portion may the blessing of legacy be our portion May the blessing of fruitfulness be our portion. May nothing wither in our life in the name of the Lord. May our fruit remain in Jesus' name. I declare preservation of life in the name of the Lord. Nothing lost, nothing broken, nothing missing. I declare the peace of God. May the peace of God be upon your life right now. That peace that passes all understanding. May the Lord bless you when you come in. May the Lord bless you when you go out. May the Lord bless the fruit of your womb. May the Lord bless your words. May the Lord bless your downsetting. May the Lord bless your uprising. May the Lord bless your life by day. May the Lord bless your life by night. May the Lord bless the work of your hand. May the anointing come upon you to be fruitful and to prosper in every endeavor. May God make you an icon. May God make you an example. May God make you a model to follow. May God make you a teacher to the world that is around you. May the reward of the Lord be in your house. May the reward of the Lord be in your mouth. In the name of the Lord, may you be blessed with the righteous man's reward. May you be blessed with the prophet's reward. May you be blessed with the reward of the Lord on you now. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. May you be blessed to go get that thing that didn't work and make it work this time. May what didn't work in your last season will work in this season of your life. In Jesus' mighty name, let everybody say, let it be so. Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keeps you. Glove on someone before you go. In Jesus' name, amen. On behalf of Bishop Hugh, Pastor Letha, and the Embassy Covenant Church International family, happy birthday to all those in April. Holy Ghost Impartation is Sunday, April 21st. 
If you desire to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, or maybe you want a closer walk with God or refreshing, join Pastor DeBrand Sunday, April 21st, here at Embassy Metro Detroit, immediately following service in the Blue Room. Do you have a formal and professional background in agriculture? If so, Apostle Smith is looking for you. If you are interested in serving Embassy Nation with your expertise and passion for agriculture, please take a moment and see the midweek email or scan the QR code on the screen to let us know that you are interested to serve in Embassy Nation. Attention all parents. Because of safety concerns, we would like to ask that strollers not be brought into the sanctuary. We have designated a stroller parking area for your convenience. This area will be marked and located in the lobby near the coat racks directly behind the couches located in the Welcome Center. All strollers should be parked upon entering the building. Please remember not to leave valuables in your strollers as we cannot guarantee their safety. We appreciate your cooperation. The Embassy Metro Detroit campus is growing and the need for administrative support in the office has become increasingly crucial. We are seeking individuals who are enthusiastic about contributing their time and skills to help with administrative tasks. Whether you have experience in organizational administrative support or have a heart for service, your commitment can make a significant contribution to our campus's daily operations. If you feel called to step into this vital role and help the Embassy Administrative Team, please see your midweek email to sign up or call the office. Save the date for the Jabula North America Summit, October 2nd through the 5th. It will be held here at Embassy Metro Detroit. Details about registration are coming soon. Thank you for choosing to worship with us. Stay connected with the Embassy Covenant Church family by visiting our website for events and online giving.